Okay, so reason part one. Everybody get comfy. Crime is common. Logic is rare. Sherlock Holmes. Apparently, is there a new Sherlock Holmes television series that... There's two? And which one's better? I hear it's the British one. I hear all, all the grade nines are all psyched about this new show. I heard... All right. Okay. Is it because there's like a really cute guy on there or something maybe? I don't know. I don't. So he's got that sort of quirky appeal. All right, I think we're off topic. And it's highly creepy. Um, let's talk about reason. So Sherlock Holmes is an example of using logic to solve crimes, right? In one story, a police officer asked Holmes if anything about the crime had struck him as significant. And Holmes replied that uh, the dog in the nighttime, that the officer said, but the dog did nothing in the nighttime. And Holmes said, well, that's what's significant. Because the fact the dog wasn't barking in, at the night, in the night means that the, the thief knew the dog. The fact that the dog didn't bark means to, sort of like if you have a dog and you come home, your dog doesn't bark at you, but they bark at strangers. So Holmes said that that was significant, that the dog in the night was significant because it didn't bark. And that was a logical conclusion that he used there. So here's a summary of Holmes's logic. Watchdogs bark at strangers. The watchdog did not bark at the thief. Therefore, the thief was not a stranger. Okay? So this is a method of acquiring new knowledge. So he acquired the third piece here, that's new knowledge, using reason alone. Reason is the method, the way that he acquired that knowledge. And we use reason to go beyond the immediate evidence that our senses provide to create new logic from, or new, pardon me, new knowledge from the logic. Okay, if the pavement is wet when you go out in the morning, then you probably make a conclusion, it must have rained the night before. Maybe not the best example now. Let's say you walk out and there's snow in front of your door. You might make the conclusion that it snowed the night before. So, you know Lake Winnipeg is a freshwater lake, okay? You know that sharks don't live in fresh water. From those two premises, let me use that term, what conclusion can you draw? There's no sharks in Lake Winnipeg, okay? That's a type of reasoning, and there's benefits to it. You don't have to waste your time going and making tests in Lake Winnipeg. You don't need to go look in Lake Winnipeg for sharks, although maybe some of you did when you were kids. But you can make that conclusion based purely on logic. Logic gives you that knowledge, that information, without you having to perform any other sort of operations there. That's a good reason. Now, does it give you certainty? Are you certain that there are no sharks in Lake Winnipeg? Reason and logic tends to give you a high degree of certainty. You can almost be certain that there are no sharks in Lake Winnipeg. But maybe there's still a little bit of doubt in your mind. Here's the classic philosophical example. All human beings are mortal. Socrates is a human being, therefore Socrates is moral. This type of logic is known as a syllogism. Okay, it's assumptions and logic made on premises or a premise. So here we have two premise, two premises. All human beings are mortal. Socrates was a human being. Now, from those two premises, you draw a conclusion, which is what you did. Okay, and this is a very reasonable or rational way of using logic to come up with conclusions. So rationalism says we can discover important truths about reality using reason alone. So this is a philosophical position known as rationalism that uses reason to derive conclusions about the world. They tie into things like logic and mathematics and science. They're big on those things, okay? A famous rationalist philosopher, René Descartes, okay, based his philosophical system on this statement, uh, th I think, 
therefore I am, although he said it in Latin, right? That Latin phrase is the basis of his philosophy, that reason and logic is how you can establish sort of truths in the world. So that's why I wanted to start with this unit. Okay, I wanted to start with recursion, or sorry, with uh, reason, because in some ways philosophers claim it is the most reliable way of, a, of, a, of acquiring knowledge. And we're going to look at three different types of reasoning. Deductive reasoning, inductive reasoning, and informal reasoning. Okay? As well, we will look at some of the faults of reasoning or fallacies of reasoning okay? that you want to kind of avoid and try to watch out for is these logical fallacies, so to speak. And we'll apply those to how you can use those to create structured logical arguments in your, in your logic. A little Calvin and Hobbes for you. Dad, how come old photographs are always black and white? Didn't they have color film back then? Well, sure they did. Those old photographs are in color. It's just the world was black and white then. Really? Yep, the world didn't turn color until sometime in the 1930s, and it was pretty grainy color for a while, too. Well, that's weird. Well, truth is stranger than fiction. But then why are old paintings in color? If the world was black and white, wouldn't the artist painted it that way? Well, not necessarily. A lot of great artists were insane. But if they, how could they have painted in color anyways? Wouldn't their paints been in shades of gray and black then? Well, of course. But they turned color just like everything else did in the 1930s. So why didn't old black and white photos turn color too? Because they were color pictures of black and white, remember? The world is a complicated place, Hobbes. Whenever it seems that way, I take a nap in a tree and wait for dinner. Logic is a useful thing, but it can be used in incorrect ways as well. So although it is a strong way of knowing, one of the purposes of this unit will be let's talk about the strengths of logic and reason, and then let's tear down the faults of logic and reason. Okay, so let's start with deductive reasoning. What does that mean? Well, deductive reasoning is formally just basically where you reason from the general to the particular. So for example, all dogs are mammals, Fido is a dog, therefore Fido is a mammal. So this is the general statement. All dogs are mammals, right? All dogs are mammals. That's very general. This statement is particular. Fido is a dog. That's a very particular statement. And then we came up with a conclusion. So deductive reasoning moves from that general statement to a very particular statement, right? Um, I have some other examples in a second, okay? This is known as a syllogism. It's a deductive argument. The formal term for it is a syllogism. And ge generally, the structure of the syllogism is two premises and a conclusion, okay? There are three terms that you usually bounce around within those, which occur twice, right? The word dogs appeared twice, right, and mammals. We have quantifiers like all, some, no, one, things like that. But that's generally the way a proper syllogism is structured. Okay? That's my Star Trek quote. I had to look that up to make sure it was correct. I don't know who Valeris is. Someone, any Star Trek people in here? No one knows. I don't know who he is. Oh. Okay. Truth and validity. So let's talk about truth and validity. We've already talked about this before. But they don't mean the same thing. Truth and validity, believe it or not, don't mean the same thing. Truth is concerned with what is the case, and validity is essentially whether the conclusions follow from the premises. So validity, or whether something's valid, relates directly to a syllogism. Just because something's valid doesn't mean it's true. Okay, and I'm going to show you that in a second. So an argument can be said to be either valid or invalid, and the statements within the argument can be said to be true or false. So an argument can be valid but false. And I'm going to show you some examples of that. Okay. So an argument is said to be valid if the conclusion follows logically. If the conclusion does not follow logically, it's said to be invalid. The point of this is independent from the truth. So here's an example. All panthers are pink. That's a false statement. 
right? All panthers are not pink. Uh, Shea Guevara is a panther. That's also false. That's a false statement. Shea Guevara is pink. It's also false. But is that third statement valid? Remember, validity, that's the, what you're talking about is a truth statement. He's not pink. So let's just say it, it's false. He's not pink. But is this third statement valid based on the premises? It is, isn't it? Based on these two premises, that is still valid. It's false, but it's a valid conclusion. So just because something's valid doesn't mean it's true. And that's the difference there. Okay? There's a difference between truth and validity. Okay? So I'll show you another example. Both of the premises and the conclusion of the argument are false, but the argument itself is valid. Now, an argument can also be valid when the premises are false and the conclusion is true. Here's an example. All ostriches are teachers. That's false. Mr. Wax is an ostrich. That's false. Therefore, Mr. Wax is a teacher. That's actually true, right? So we have a true conclusion. Is it a valid conclusion? It's also valid, right? But it's valid and true based on two false premises, right? The two premises before it are, in fact, false. Yet the conclusion is true, and the conclusion is valid. So this is weird, right? The logic itself can still result in all kinds of different combinations of true and false, right? I could have said all humans are teachers. That might be a true statement, right? I could say Wax is a human. That would be a true statement. Therefore, Wax is a teacher. That would be a true statement. But what if I said this? All humans are teachers. That's true. OK? Um, Kyle is a human. That's true. Oh, we could debate that. But no, let's just assume that's true. Therefore, Kyle is a teacher. That's false. But it's still valid, right? It's still a valid structure. It has a true premise, a true premise, a false conclusion. Well, we're not getting into that, but yes. Um, so logic itself has to also be analyzed. Just because you can set up a valid syllogism doesn't mean it's going to be true. Just because you have an invalid syllogism doesn't mean it's going to be false. So, well, that's great. You've just thrown way more questions on the table walks, but that's the whole point of DOK. OK, so let's take a look at this argument structure. So pure logic is concerned only with structure, right? So let's, let's take the examples off the table. And let's go purely to logic itself, OK? It doesn't matter if the premises are false or true. Okay, all that matters is the conclusion is valid. So all A's are B's, some A's are C's, therefore some B's are C's. Doesn't matter what you put in place of A, B, or C. We got, can have a valid argument here if we structure it that way. So the first thing about a syllogism is, is it structured properly? Right? Then we have to look at each premise. Once we actually put something in place of A, then we have to take a look at it and go, well, OK, is it not just structured properly, but is it true? Is the true fa or falsity of that statement itself important for the conclusion? But I think you start with the structure. If you just make sure the structure is valid, then you go and examine truth. Okay? But if you don't have structure, you don't have much. Okay? <clears throat> so. The content of an argument and its structure can help avoid a bias of belief, okay? Because we have that. We have biases based on our belief. So we have a tendency to believe that an argument is valid just because we agree with the conclusion. So here's an example. Liberals are in favor of free speech. Dictators are not liberals. Therefore, dictators are not in favor of free speech. First of all, is this a valid syllogism? What do you think? Is it structured properly, right, with the whole A, B, C structure and process? Is that a valid syllogism? OK, now let's look at the truth of each statement. 
So we'll take each of the two premises. You could argue in favor that the first is, in fact, a true statement. You could argue, in fact, that the second is a true statement. So now, is the conclusion a true statement? It still needs to be examined. But we might be biased to believe that it's true because we have sort of a structural sort of process there. Okay? Just because we agree with the conclusion does not mean that it's a logical argument here. OK. You guys ever heard of Blaise Pascal before? Where have you heard of him? Pascal's wager. Pascal is a mathematician. Some of you have done uh, the Pascal math contest. Anyone ever done that or heard of it at least? So he was a mathematician, but he was also a philosopher. And you're actually going to find a lot of that, believe it or not. A lot of philosophers are mathematicians. Weird, isn't it? But that's the case. And uh, Pascal's wager is actually a statement on religion. Um, but I'm not going to get into that right now. OK. And I want to show you now, sort of wrap up today with something called Venn diagrams, which, believe it or not, I don't know if any of you watched, uh, this week, uh, the Late Show with uh, Seth Meyers started after the whole Tonight Show with G um, who's the Tonight Show? Jim, Jimmy Fallon, Seth Meyers, and Jimmy both used to be on SNL. And one of his bits, so I watched the first couple. It's only been two on. Is he has a bit on Venn diagrams? It would have been funny if I would have showed that to you today, but I didn't have time to dig it up. But uh, Venn diagrams is a visual way to sometimes show what's going on. You've seen them before, these idea of overlapping circles, right? So this idea here that some Bs are, in fact, Cs, and that some As are Cs, right? So you can sort of get that feeling using the visual of the Venn diagram. So this example would show that all As are Cs and all Bs are Cs, right, and stuff like that. So the way that Venn diagrams are drawn will often Im imply the situation itself. Penguins are black and white. Some old TV shows are black and white. Therefore, some penguins are old TV shows. Sense. Yeah, it's sound, okay? It's got a sound or a valid structure. But logic is something that penguins are not very good at. All right. We are never more true to ourselves than we when we are inconsistent. Okay, so deductive reasoning and how it preserves truth. So we've seen that the validity of an argument has nothing to do with the truth or falsity. It can be valid but still false. Okay, Just because it's valid doesn't prove it's true. To be sure that the conclusion is true, you must answer these two questions. Is it valid, but also, are the premises true? That's what I've been sort of stating. Logic is useful to start by examining the premises and the validity of the argument. But we still need to go beyond that to actually look at the truth of the statement, right? You still have questions that you need to answer about the truth. So when people argue in everyday life, they rarely structure arguments in that way. When you get an argument with like your boyfriend, your girlfriend, your parents, whoever, you rarely lay it out in sort of a structured syllogism. Maybe you do. Maybe you're that kind of arguer. But it is a good way to produce, log or produce knowledge and to uh, argue a point, especially in the written word. Okay? So it is something you can use in essays to use syllogisms to come up with good conclusions. Okay? Um, deductive reasoning, therefore, is a tool. It's an instrument that you can use to help you to sort of establish a truth within your writing. But it's not necessarily a source of that truth. Okay? So we go back to the one, Socrates is mortal. This is only true if the premises are true. But how do we know the premises are true? Well, in order to do that, we have to rely on other ways of knowing. How do we know that Socrates is mortal? How do we know that Socrates is a man? How do we know that all men are mortal? We have to still defend those premises and that conclusion. And that takes us out of the realm of reason and logic sometimes and into the realms of things like experience. How do I know Socrates is a man? Well, I can see him. And I see that he's a man. 
So that in itself, or maybe you can't see them. Maybe I read it, so therefore I use language. So that's where the other ways of knowing are still going to come into play. Logic can't do it alone. It's a good start, but it itself is still going to rely on things like experience. OK, so here's what I want you guys to do today. I want you to practice those syllogisms. Here. Whoa. 